Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text, as at this point I know that you already know, is the Old Testament reading. Micah chapter 7, read just a few moments ago. Well, we've made it, or at least in a few minutes from now, we will have made it to the end of our series. We've spent two months now in the book of Micah. If you've been here every week or if you've been watching online as we go, you have in church alone heard every single word of the book. Well done. Micah had a lot to tell us over these past weeks, hasn't he? I'm sure if each of us went around, a different part of Micah would have stood out to us. Perhaps that's your conversation around the dinner table tonight. What stood out to you? I'd be willing to bet, though, that for probably most of us, one of the things that we will remember from Micah, one of the things that has stood out in the book of Micah, is one of Micah's wonderfully colorful admi- or uses of the law. The accusing of his people of their various sins. The time and time again repetition of what I warned you at the beginning was Micah leaving no punches untaken. He went after sin, dramatically even. And so we are here at the end, at the conclusion of the book. And we might be tempted. We might be tempted to think. We might even expect, after his fiery use of the law, we might expect Micah to, well, to put it bluntly, hate the people he is preaching to. After all, he has time and time and time again warned them of their sins, warned them of God's judgment, shown to them over and over and over how they are falling short And the best that he has been met with are people angry that he's preaching. People who don't want to hear anything he has to say. You can almost picture Micah at the beginning of his ministry. Imagining the future. The future that God through him and his message would bring. The utopia that would come about as a result of Micah's preaching. And I can almost see him at the end of his ministry here, looking back at how little has changed. We almost wouldn't blame him, would we? We wouldn't blame him if he had begun at least a little to hate the people that he was speaking to. To at least be angry, frustrated, perhaps, with them. And yet, shockingly, amazingly, he doesn't. I understand the parallel of me introducing Micah chapter 7 with Micah gives us a message of hope. And then the first phrase being, woe is me. Micah laments at the beginning of this chapter. His heart is grieved. He is overcome with sorrow, much like, if you'll remember, he was in chapter 1 of the book, as he lamented for his people. Micah laments not over his own sins here. Micah laments over the sins of the people, the obstinate and stubborn people that he was preaching to, the people who just would not listen to what Micah had to say. 
the people who would for everything Micah did would not turn from their wicked ways return to the Lord and live and yet instead of well resigning them to their fate instead of being angry or frustrated Micah's heart yearns for these people he loves them deeply he cares for them with everything that is in him and so when he sees their judgment coming his heart breaks for his people i would imagine that if we looked on our own life much the same story would play out if we look back on our own life, even in the past two months, let alone all of our life, if we look, take a true, good, hard look at ourselves, my guess is that we will see in bright, vivid images just how far below God's standard we truly are. I know that Micah's words have pierced me deeply over these past few months. If we're honest, I'm sure they have to us all. Every single one of us has time and time and time again fallen short of God's standard. Has time and time and time again gone our own way. And what's worse, has time and time and time again known exactly what God wants from us and chosen actively to go the other direction. We too, like the people of Micah's day, have remained obstinate and stubborn, have perhaps even done all we can to shut our ears to God's warnings and judgments against our sin. And as we, the people of God, sit here, honestly looking at ourselves and how mired and broken and sinful we truly are, we might be tempted as well. We might almost expect that God, too, would hate not only the people of Micah's day, Perhaps it's a deep fear that because of our sins, God would hate us as well. And yet, in spite of all human reasoning, just as Micah cared and loved so deeply for his people, so too does God not hate you for your sins, but so too does God who sees your sins more clearly than you ever can, feel deep and overwhelming love for you. When God sees the sinful, broken, mired person that you are, he is not angry. He feels deep and overwhelming love. He cares for you. And while you cannot fix the problems of sin that are overwhelming you, God has stepped in. God has brought himself into your life. Because God sees your sin and loves you so deeply, he brought you, called you to himself. It was God's love for the people of old that caused him to send Micah to preach to them all those years ago. It was God's love for you that caused him to send Micah all those years ago to preach to us as well. It was because of God's love for each and every one of you that caused him to send his son. To send Christ, so that he might live for you, so that he might die for you, 
so that you, who is too broken in your sinfulness to fix the problem and the brokenness within you, Christ fixed it for you. Christ lived and died for you so that he might on your behalf overcome the sin that is in your life. Yes, Micah weeps and laments for his people. He laments for those who do not listen. Those who refuse to return to the Lord who loves them so deeply. Micah's left almost without hope. And yet, even Micah is encouraged. Words from the congregation of believers to Micah. Words from the whole host of the faithful to us as well. And if I'm honest, my absolute favorite verse of the whole book. Micah 7, verse 8. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Micah is encouraged. We are encouraged. That though we fall and stumble due to our sinfulness, our brokenness, and the nagging doubts of guilt, though we fall, it is Christ who picks us up. Though we so often are stuck in the darkness of our sinfulness, the darkness of our guilt, the certainty that because of what we have done, we cannot be loved, we who sit in darkness Christ brings his light to us. So that even while we are stuck in the deep darkness of despair, our Lord shines upon us. God is the light to us. He is the one who lifts us up. So that when sin gloats over us, when temptation and guilt tell us that we are unlovable because of what we have done, we can respond in confidence of Christ. Yes, we have fallen now. Yes, we are broken. But none of that matters. For God is our God. He loves us us. He sent his son for us. He overcomes all things, even the sins and the guilt which we have. Christ has overcome. In all things, Christ is the conqueror. So then we too, with the people of God, the host of the faithful, can join with Micah in his hymn of praise. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity. Passing over transgression. He does not retain his anger forever, for he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us and will tread our iniquities underfoot. You cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob. Steadfast love to Abraham. Eternal mercies to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may this peace which passes all human understanding Keep your hearts and your minds in this true faith to life everlasting. Amen.